Um, hi, everyone. I hope I'm going to live up to that introduction. Um, so I came to the bar in 2001, which obviously is both eons ago and feels like about 10 minutes ago. I vividly remember making my pupillage applications. And I um, am what I think of as a normal person. So I went to a really quite crap state school and I failed to get into Oxbridge and went to Manchester, which obviously at the time felt like a total disaster. Can report back that it's all been totally fine, didn't matter at all. Um, I didn't think about law. Then I went to university to do English literature and uh, then finished my degree, had a year out and then effectively decided to come to the bar pretty much on a whim, which is a very, very bad basis um, on which to decide to do an expensive training course with low prospects of getting um, a job at the end of it. Um, but anyway, I'm glad I did. And uh, so I managed to get pupillage through a series of strokes of um, enormous luck. And I started off at a chambers called Two Temple Gardens. I did my pupillage there, which is a kind of general civil set, um, which at the time also did quite a bit of banking and insurance and construction. And those three areas are the kind of main areas of what generally is called commercial law. Commercial law by itself isn't actually a thing. Nobody practices specifically in commercial law. They, they, they do uh, industries within commerce. And the key thing that really sort of distinguishes commercial law cases is that they're pretty much all about contracts. There's somebody's done a deal with someone else and it's gone wrong for some reason or another and now there's a claim coming out of that. And um, the, the core thing about my particular bit of commercial law, I'm going to really tell you why I love my job. Um, so I, I um, didn't know about construction. I'd never heard of it when I was applying for the bar. And I probably would have thought, oh, well, I'm an English lit person, so um, clearly I can't do anything that's to do with building things. Um, that is uh, total rubbish. You just have to be a good barrister, not a um, good engineer, to do my kind of law. Um, and we don't uh, look for any technical knowledge of any kind when people are applying. Um, and uh, I found out about it because my second pupil supervisor at Two Temple Gardens specialised in construction. So I started doing the work with him and I was like, this is amazing. And the reason it's so much fun is, uh, <clears throat> is that you get this really cool combination of the intellectual challenge of contract law and um, contract related issues which are really really hard you know they're intellectually difficult and actually one of the things that's been most difficult for me about the pandemic is that I'm not in chambers so I can't ask my friends in chambers what the answer is to all my cases every day Relatable. it has been a real problem um, and so I had to make packs of people where we could whatsapp each other at any time about I've, I've just got this clause can you just have a look at it and see what you think um, and so you get the, the intellectual challenge of the of, the, of contract law itself and combine with um, a specialist sort of technical issue in, in, in each case. And <clears throat> so you get help from your client, obviously, who knows how to build things. Um, and you have expert engineers or expert architects, whatever the relevant profession might be. It's a bit like doing um, clinical negligence, where you know nobody would think if you weren't going to go into prof neg and do um, doctor's negligence that you needed to be a doctor you'd have a heart surgeon that was explaining to you what went wrong in the particular operation, right? So it's the same for me. I get an engineer that tells me what went wrong when they were building the shard or what went wrong when they were building Wembley or whatever it might be. And I learn enough about that to cross-examine an engineer on the other side and make them admit they're wrong. And so that's an intellectual challenge as well. It's different in every case. And um, it's one of my favourite bits of the job is that I'll get a new case in and there'll be some new interesting thing might be about a problem on an oil rig, might be about how you build a nuclear power station, super, super cool, different every time. And the third thing I love about my area of uh, law is the clients. Um, I hang out with builders and they are the most fun people. It is absolutely brilliant. And the when you are starting off, obviously you're doing smaller value cases, so you might be doing um, a dispute about someone's house, like a domestic uh, refurb on someone's house. But now I do, um, and have done for quite a long time, I do um, kind of mega projects, basically. So, um, and I do a lot of international arbitration. That's the other feature of work in my area. You can effectively choose whether you want to be a UK high court barrister or an international arbitration barrister or a combination of the two. And I do about 50-50 because I like doing, I like the different skills and the different approaches that you need in the high court and in international arbitration. But there are people in my chambers that are 100% one or the other. 
Um, and so I get to uh, hang out with these people who run these massive projects, um, you know, $500 million projects or more, and they make decisions every day that are worth really quite staggering sums of money, and they just have to decide what we're going to do. And sometimes I'm like on standby in the case, and they, they know that they're going to have a bit of an argument, so they have a barrister sort of uh, to give them advice while the project is still live. But usually they just have to make their minds up, there's just no time. Um, and so you have enormous respect for these, these sort of incredibly sort of shrewd, practical, down to earth people taking these enormous decisions. Um, and then they come in and say, Lucy, you know, are we fucked or are we not? And and that's, uh, it's, you know, it's... it's, it's that's a technical term. It, it, <laughs> it, it's really, it's really good fun. It's not, it's not my area of law is not men in grey suits, um, kind of going, Neil, well, what do you think the answer might be because of the Supreme Court? It's, it's really live projects, proper people. Um, and I also get to go around London and also all around the world saying, oh, yeah, that one's mine, the Dubai venture, that's mine. Um, and uh, telling people about the interesting thing that went wrong with whatever with whatever that project was. Um, I'm supposed to do key skills and personal qualities, and I've got, I think, about one minute left. Um, I, uh, I don't think you need any personal qualities to be a barrister. There's no specific ones. You need some skills. So you need to have a kind of analytical kind of intelligence. It's quite a weird kind of intelligence to be a barrister. It's not... I don't think it's, like, pure intelligence. I think it's very practical and applied. Um... You also, you will have to work hard, but you don't have to be a hard-working person. I am extremely lazy, um, and what I need is loads of horrible deadlines to get me off the sofa with a novel and a cup of tea. Um, so my life is effectively a permanent essay crisis, but <laughs> otherwise I would just lie on the floor the whole time, just doing nothing. So if, if so you, you, you can be a very hard-working person, and I know lots of those at the commercial bar, but you can also be really lazy and just enjoy the challenge. Um, so um, you obviously got to be a good advocate, but that's the thing you can learn. Um, you need to be a good advocate both orally and in, in, in writing. And you need to be a person who doesn't mind being given just an avalanche of documents to read through. And that your job is to sort out what's really happened and pick out the points that matter from a massive, massive factual information usually presented in a confusing a confusing way so if you like the kind of idea of a bit of a detective puzzle about it and making a coherent story out of a bit of a mess that's also a, a, a real feature of the commercial bar um, I'm going to stop talking and hand over now thank you um, so my name's Emma Dixon I'm a public and human rights law barrister at Blackstone Chambers uh, Got some of our very glossy pupilage guides here. Um, and Matthew's asked us to talk about a few things, so I'm just going to try and hit some of his points. Uh, why I chose the bar in this area of practice. So I did maths at university and found it really boring. And um, while I was there, I became involved in quite a lot of feminist groups and human rights groups. And so I became interested <laughs> in discrimination and human rights. And I wanted to find a way to carry on doing that work rather than going and becoming either a maths teacher or a banker, which were my options. And so um, I didn't know anything about the law or the bar, really. Um, and I got, in those days, a book, which was a directory, and I looked up human rights law, and I found uh, my chambers and applied there. Um, <laughs> so I, that was kind of lucky. Um, Ah, my chamber's director sent me a long email this morning telling me what I should tell you. One of the things she said was that you should keep an open mind about what kind of work you do. Um, and I actually completely disagree with that. I always <coughs> wanted to do discrimination in human rights. And I put a lot of energy into focusing on that and getting that kind of work. So although I really enjoy my pupillage, and if you do a pupillage with us, you will do commercial law and employment law and public law and human rights. And I really enjoyed that. And I still have my untouched copy of Chitty on Contracts that my pupil supervisor gave me as a um, <laughs> congratulations for being taken on present. Untouched. Untouched. Pretty much. Um, so, uh, horses for courses. I think it's fine to know what you love and have a passion for it and go for it. Um, obviously, you don't know something surprising and lovely might happen along the way that you're not expecting as well. Uh, what types of cases do I deal with? Well, it's very varied. At the moment, I'm doing a few... Um, judicial reviews about radio and um, the Ofcom regulation of the BBC. So I'm doing a case about Radio 1 Dance and a case about Radio 1 Relax, which is a relaxation station for the pandemic. Um, 
So uh, I also give quite a lot of advice to the Bar Standards Board on discrimination matters. So recently I advised on the protection of uh, information about transgender barristers. Um, I'm trying to think what else I'm doing at the moment, but basically a whole load of different things. And come and talk to me afterwards if you want to know more about that. What do I find appealing about this area of practice? Really the variety and the fact that you can choose your own specialism and you can kind of wander around within it. So at one point in my life, I became very interested in environmental issues and I was doing a lot of environmental campaigning in my home life. I stood for Parliament for the Green Party. Um, that's just a little plug for the Green Party there. Uh, other political parties are available. Um, <laughs> And so at that point, I started doing a lot of environmental JR. I worked with Friends of the Earth. I worked with uh, WWF. Um, so, yeah. And just recently, I've become quite interested in the regulation of the internet and internet law, free speech on the internet and discrimination and hate speech on the internet. And so I've started to do some work in that area, um, including with the EHRC. So again, you can kind of get an interest and you can then go and follow it in your professional life. And that's an amazing thing about public law, which I think maybe doesn't apply so much to other areas of law. Uh, the lifestyle implications. Oh, I can actually slow down. I've only had four minutes. <laughs> the lifestyle implications. Well, so again, my practice manager tells me, oh, you have to be very flexible. You have to work very hard. Uh, that you'll be doing lots of trials. It'll be very intensive. You have to work all the time and stick to time limits and blah, blah. But I want to say this. I have had a great work-life balance for the last 22 years. I started working four days a week when my daughter was born. She's 22. I still work four days a week. Uh, I take the school holidays off. Um, there can be a little bit of a macho thing about long hours culture. As a barrister, you are self-employed and you choose how many cases you take on. Sometimes you will be working very long hours on a particular case at a particular time, but you choose how many cases you take on and that also determines how much money you make and you can make different choices about that. It's not that the only choice is to work six or seven days a week and 18 hours a day until your eyes are swiveling around to the back of your head. You, you have options. Sometimes you may be getting up at 5 a.m. or working until midnight, but that can be exceptional if you choose for it to be exceptional in your life. And I am a huge believer in that. Um, we can have good work-life balance at the civil bar. Criminal bar, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, it seems appalling, but <laughs> an amazing job to do, nevertheless. Um, so key skills and personal qualities needed to succeed. Um, a female silk who was in my chambers when I joined, when there really weren't that many female silks at the time, uh, used to say, anyone can look the law up in a book. I think interpersonal skills are incredibly important. Um, getting on with your clients, maybe being able to inject a bit of humor into a difficult situation, uh, being able to keep your cool when other people are losing theirs because the buck stops with you which can be incredibly stressful and draining um but being able to get on with people i think is is hugely important whether the people are the judge in court or your clients or your clerks or your colleagues pupils etc um but i completely agree with what you said it's not there's not like a set type of person that can be a good barrister you know you can be a good barrister if you want to be a good barrister and you can do it you can bring yourself into the room. You can do it your way. You, you don't have to be a sort of set stereotype thing. Um, any personal qualities, finishing on this. Oh, no, I've got one more thing after this. Um, but any personal qualities that would make it very hard to succeed, uh, Matt asked me. And I think if you were really capped in chaos, it would be hard to succeed. But I think... Even then, you could begin as Captain Chaos, and you could then evolve into somebody who was uh, successful at the bar, maybe a bit of a maverick. But I think there's an element of having to keep tabs on what you're doing, because you are self-employed, you're doing your accounts, you're doing your VAT, you're, doing, you're writing articles, you're, you're going to networking events, you're also running your practice and your cases. So, um, yeah, if you're Captain Chaos, maybe work on that. Um, and so I just want to finish with something about Chambers and how it is for me. 
And there's a quote in this brochure from Legal Cheek, and I don't really understand how it got in Legal Cheek because it's not really funny or interesting. But it says, the true distinguishing feature of Blackstone from all other top tier sets, just most amazing people, it's really like having a professional family. And for me, yeah, yeah my colleagues really are my family. My chamber's roommate is literally like a brother to me and we look after each other's children and go on holiday together. And maybe that's unusual, I don't know, but it, it really is having lovely people, like a sort of extended version of university, if you had a good time at university, if not, forget that comment. Um, and we do also have fun and, uh, for example, recently we had an employment law networking event where we all went on a street art tour of Shoreditch and then did a massive spray painted mural afterwards and all put on boiler suits. So we don't just sit in chambers frowning at our computers or, you know, being very um, articulate to judges. We do also occasionally let our hair down for those of us who have hair to let down. Um, anyway, there we go. That's with one minute to spare. Thank you so much for listening and it's really lovely to be here and do come and chat to me afterwards. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Michael Cotterley. I practice at 106 Court, a large commercial set in London. I've been a tenant for just over a year. Uh, we're here at booth three near the entrance. So if you haven't already said hi, please come and do so. Um, my path to the bar could be the subject of its own talk. Luckily, we don't have the time. Uh, but uh, given my accent, uh, maybe it's a bit useful just to explain that I'm originally from Canada. I originally qualified there, and I also practiced at a Magic Circle law firm in London before transferring to the bar. So I can also provide some insight later on, if you'd like, about comparison between working at a law firm and working at the bar. But uh, suffice to say, um, in terms of why I chose the bar, um, I'll just focus on uh, three things. Uh, one is I like the independence. It's basically running your own business. Um, I love the intellectual rigor. Uh, and third, um, the variety and flexibility that is available uh, as a self-employed barrister is just without comparison to other aspects of the legal profession. Uh, I'm gonna talk about three points today. I'll explain a little bit of what my practice looks like, um, what a day in the life of a commercial barrister might look like, and uh, what makes a good commercial barrister, at least in my view. Um, a bit about my practice to start. Um, so my practice spans commercial litigation, uh, international commercial arbitration, and investor state arbitration. Um, as well, I also do advisory work. Um, and as Lucy already said, you know, the way to summarize what is commercial um, practice, it really is just matters involving commerce or business, and typically these involve contracts. Um, but what that means in practice um, really can vary considerably. So for example, I, I have defended a bank in a dispute over the purchase and sale of mortgage loans. No, please don't all leave at the same time. Um, I've also acted for a water company uh, relating uh, to its purchase of a business, a retail business, uh, involving water and sewerage, and learning much more about uh, sewers in London than I ever cared to do so. Um, I've also acted in a shareholder dispute uh, relating to the operation of a copper mine in Zambia. You might ask, where is the contract there? Uh, well, the relationship between the shareholders is governed by a shareholder's agreement, so enter the commercial barristers. Um, but I've also defended a well-known online marketplace provider, you can guess who that is, uh, defending a claim brought by a reseller seeking a refund of fees that they paid uh, to the marketplace provider. So these are all contractual disputes, but they're all incredibly varied. You have banking, you have utilities, you have mining, you have tech. Um, so when someone says a commercial barrister, you know, look deeper into that question what that actually means, and it'll depend on the barrister, it'll depend on the client, and it'll depend on the set. I also do a little bit of chancery work, um, usually just acting for companies who go after delinquent directors from stealing money from the company, allegedly. Um, <laughs> But the point is the practice is incredibly broad. Uh, I've worked on advising on a COVID-related <coughs> dispute involving a caravan park. I've advised on a business dispute in the cosmetic surgery industry, again, learning much more than I ever thought I would ever learn about cosmetic surgery. Uh, and advising a company on jurisdictional and applicable law issues arising from damage caused to an underwater cable on the high seas is something I never thought I would say before I went to the bar. Um, one other thing I will say is that a lot of my work is led. And what that means as a junior barrister is I often work with a more senior barrister, uh, typically a silk or a queen's counsel. Um, but some of my work is also unled, um, which is work that is done by myself. There's pros and cons to both. 
Um, the advantage of lead work is that you're learning a lot from someone who's really hopefully at the top of their game and can teach you in the process, hopefully. Um, the other aspect of working independently, however, uh, is that um, the buck really does stop with you, and so that's a real great opportunity to develop your skills as a barrister, both in terms of your written and oral advocacy. Um, in terms of answering the question of lifestyle implications, um, look, you do work hard at the commercial bar. You will also work very hard in commercial practice. Um, and I just want to echo Emma's comments, first of all, that a lot of this can be in your control. Uh, and it's important to draw those boundaries as soon as you can in practice. Um, and learning the value of, I hate to say it, I don't hate to say it, learning the value of saying no. Um, and at some point you're going to have to learn to do it because you've probably spent most of your life saying yes at this point in your life. And at some point you're going to have to start saying no. Um, and I just want to echo the comments too about macho culture. I think we really do need to end uh, the practice of using busy as a description of how your life is going and how that, that should be used as some sort of positive aspect of what your life is like. Um, so I think we need to sort of, we need to do some self-reflection on that. But I, I will say, however, it, one does work hard, and when the case does require it, then you know one does have to work hard. But you know, book the holiday for after that case, for example, might be a way to, to, to deal with balance that way. Um, what a day in the life of a commercial barrister looks like really, really does depend. And it's going to depend on what's going on in your practice. Um, so for example, if you're working on a very big piece of litigation, say a trial that's going to last for months, um, you're going to just be preparing for that trial. You're going to be writing an opening skeleton, you're going to be preparing for cross-examinations, or you'll be attending the hearing itself. Um, but you might, at another time, have a lot of cases on the go. And in that sense, you might be preparing for smaller hearings, writing pleadings, writing written submissions, uh, and the, or writing research notes, uh, and the like. Um, but one point to note is that, at least from my perspective as a junior commercial barrister, is that a lot of the practice can be paper-based. Um, and so, you know, if you have a vision like in the show Silk or otherwise that you're going to court every day, that is not likely a reality. Again, if you have a big trial, you might be in court for like months at a time. And then when that happens, that's all very exciting and, and draining. Uh, but the idea of sort of appearing for a different client every day is just, at least from my perspective, not the reality of, of a commercial barrister. Um, skills and qualities that make a great commercial barrister. I think rigor goes without saying. You'll hear it all the time, so I'm not going to spend any time on that. But I want to emphasize thinking commercially and thinking strategically. Um, it's hard to have that skill when you're in school, but it's a skill that does come with age and it comes with practice. But it's about having a sense to what issues actually matter for a client and what issues actually matter for your judge or decision maker. So what does that look like in practice? So for example, not just considering what is the legal position on a claim, but what's the value of pursuing that claim? What actual outcome are you going to obtain uh, from bringing that claim? And it's not just about being right on a legal position. It doesn't matter if you're right. You have to be able to convince your decision maker that you are right. And it's not just saying because the law you know, says this. You need to have a story behind it. You need to have a narrative behind it. You, need, you want the judge to want to agree with you, not just to say, oh, I'm just right. Furthermore, being proactive. I think this is a really undervalued skill of being a commercial barrister. This is about how you manage your practice, managing your client. One of the things I do uh, when I get a request for advice is I try to read the papers immediately because I know there's going to be things missing. And so if I read that early, I can then very early say, you haven't given me this and this and this and this. The contract. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes the or, contract. Or you've just given me the odd pages of the contract. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Quite. And it's a bit embarrassing to ask for that the day before you said the advice was going to be done. Um, so, you know, these are, these are ways you can uh, be proactive. Be proactive about deadlines. Be proactive about how you might be um, of assistance to your solicitors when you're working in a very long-running case. Are you able to roll up your sleeves and help the client get over the finish line? Um, finally, and I've probably very much spoken over my time, um, working independently but also being a team player. You'll hear all the time that an important skill of being a barrister is being able to work independently, and that's certainly true. But in the commercial bar, being a team player is also very important. As I've already said, uh, most of my cases are led, uh, which, uh, and then on top of that, sometimes you're going to be on really, really big cases, which means you might be with a large team of barristers or an even larger team of solicitors, and you need to be able to work with others, get on with them, and also being able to manage each other uh, in the process. Look, I really like life at the commercial bar. I think it's very enjoyable, it's intellectually stimulating, and you work on some pretty interesting issues in business, and also sometimes about mortgage loans. 
Um, you, you may not be armed with the best anecdotes for dinner parties. Those will always be the criminal barristers, I suspect. And actually, I think Emma also sounds like she has, I want to hear about Radio 1 Relax a bit more. Um, you may not have the same sort of anecdotes for dinner parties, but it's a very enjoyable practice. Thank you. <laughs>